Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Bill Gillen, and I'm the co-chair of the Low Center Thoracic Oncology Presidential Committee. And on behalf of my co-chair, Alice Cutler, myself, and the Low Center faculty, I'm thrilled to welcome you to the Low Center breakout session today. Uh, I hope all of you have had the opportunity to uh, enjoy the Presidential Symposium general session this morning, and we look to build upon that success this afternoon. Um, our goal this afternoon is to introduce you to some of the best and brightest minds in cancer research and care, um, and to do it in the most interactive way possible um, given this virtual experience. So with that in mind, I'd like to start with sharing with you some of the ways that you can participate today um, by walking you through some of the technology that you'll be dealing with. Um, that in and of itself may be a bit of a uh, frightening proposition that I'm coaching anyone on technology, um, but I do assure you that there are technicians that are off screen and off camera uh, that are here to help all of us. So with that said, um, what I would ask of all of you is um, to notice in the upper left-hand corner of your screen that there's an icon that looks like a camera and another that looks like a microphone. Um, if you float your pointer over those icons um, and click, you will get a window that asks if you'd like to activate uh, both the camera and the audio. And I would suggest that you click yes, so that in the future, if you do have a question during the sessions, um, you can raise your hand and we'll bring you up on screen to ask your question. Um, so naturally the question is, well, how do you do that once you've activated your camera and your audio? Um, if you look to the right-hand side of your screen, you will see your name. And below your name, there will be a series of icons. Um, one of them is raising your hand, the picture of a raised hand. If you click on that, um, you'll have the opportunity to ask a question of our speakers later in the session. Um, once you've raised your hand, your name will go to the top of the list. Um, our technicians off screen, when the time is right, will call upon you and give you an opportunity to ask your question. Um, the other ways that you can participate, there's also a green um, icon that says room chat. It's a round icon. Um, you can click on that and it will give you the opportunity to type in a comment. Um, you may see that I have already demonstrated that by typing in my name, a little bit about uh, my role here, and then also uh, just sharing that I'm excited to share a really incredible program with you today. Um, what I might suggest as a starting point for people to get comfortable with the technology um, is to click on that room chat and just type in your name, an introduction, um, and maybe what you hope to get out of our session today or your interest in thoracic oncology. Next, along the way, if you want to type in a question or have your question read uh, to one of our speakers, you'll see a round icon on the right-hand side next to the room chat. It has a question mark in it. Um, if you click on that, uh, which is Q&A, it will give you the opportunity to type in your question at that point, you type in your question and hit the enter key, and that question will be given to one of our moderators who will read the question um, to the speaker on your behalf. Um, so that's a brief overview and uh, sort of some of the logistics. I hope I've covered things thoroughly. Uh, by way of background, um, this, by the way, is the 12th gathering of the Low Center supporters. Our, our goal today, as in past sessions, is to learn about progress uh, in lung cancer research and patient care at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Um, frankly, because becoming educated is important to fulfilling our responsibility to be good ambassadors of Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. So let me briefly review our agenda for today. Um, we have three really exciting and interesting conversations to cover. Um, the first to note is that we're making important strides in the center. Um, and, and none of this progress would be possible without you, your support, and your generosity. So I think an important place to start um, is to say thank you um, 
on behalf of all of the faculty at Dana-Farber. This is a, a really meaningful group in terms of our support of the Low Center Research and Care. In terms of the agenda, we're first going to get a, an update on the Low Center from Pasayani, um, discussing progress uh, through the COVID crisis. Um, next, we're going to have a conversation about a very exciting new uh, center at Dana-Farber focused on EGFR mutations in lung cancer. Uh, and then finally, we're going to have a conversation about artificial intelligence and how it's catalyzing cancer research and care. Um, finally, my co-chair, Alice Cutler, will be wrapping up and opening up, uh, opening up the conversation to any final comments or questions. Um, I would also, before I introduce Posse to take us from here, I would um, just encourage you to remember that we'd love for this to be interactive. If you have a question, please feel free to raise your hand. Um, and please also feel free to type in questions or comments as we uh, move through the program today, and we'd be happy to address those. Um, so please, it's my great honor to introduce Pasayani. Uh, Pasayani, MD, PhD, is the director of the Lowe Center for Thoracic Oncology and the Director Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and Director of the Belfer Institute for Applied Cancer Sciences. He's made seminal therapeutic discoveries, including being one of the co-discoverers of the EGFR mutations, and his studies have helped define the current treatment paradigm for EGFR mutant lung cancer patients. In fact, a few months ago, the prestigious professional organization, American Society of Clinical Oncology, ASCO, awarded Dr. Yanni the ASCO Science of Oncology Award for his pioneering work in this field. Dr. Yanni's Dr. main Yanni. interests center around understanding and translating the therapeutic importance of oncogenic Dr. alterations in lung cancers. Dr. Yanni is one of the most influential scientific investigators in the world and the recipient of several prestigious awards. Of equal importance, Dr. Yanni is a passionate and caring clinician and it's my pleasure to turn it over to you, Pasi. Thank you very much, Bill. Uh, thank you for that very uh, kind introduction. Uh, and uh, welcome everybody uh, to our uh, Low Center for Thoracic Oncology breakout. Uh, all of us are coming, uh, coming from our uh, virtual places and it's nice that we're able to connect through this uh, uh, platform. Uh, we'll, as Bill mentioned, we'll have an opportunity to hear a little bit about the center uh, and then uh, we'll talk about the, uh, the, the EGFR Center and then about artificial intelligence. And I want to encourage all of you to uh, uh, save some time and ask questions and that we're happy to, uh, uh, to answer those. So could I have the slides uh, for the center? Okay, great. So uh, I wanted to uh, go through uh, some of the uh, updates for the center um, and uh, kind of uh, <clears throat> see how this has uh, changed over the last uh, year. Uh, of course, uh, it's been a, a difficult year because of COVID, and I will address uh, how uh, how we've been able to manage that and uh, what kinds of uh, uh, things we've been able to do uh, throughout that time. So uh, I wanted to give an update on uh, on a little bit about staffing, kind of a, a little bit on research impact, and then ultimately on philanthropy as well. So uh, uh, this, this kind of gives everyone a composition of our center. Uh, we're about uh, 17 medical oncologists, uh, all with an interest in lung cancer. Um, there are several of us who do laboratory-based research, either wet laboratory-based research or dry laboratory-based research. We have a number of clinical researchers and clinical investigators. Uh, we have additional clinicians who have uh, other uh, administrative roles within the institution, uh, and then individuals who have leadership roles on either as Clinical uh, uh, research, chief clinical research officer, clinical uh, chief quality officer, uh, and then uh, uh, individuals who uh, spend their clinical time either on the inpatient service or on one of our satellites at St. Elizabeth's. Our service wouldn't be possible without uh, clinical nursing support, and we have five nurse practitioners and six program nurses that help in various uh, clinical aspects uh, of, uh, of clinical care of our patients uh, from uh, first meeting our patients who come into the clinic, walking them through the, what, what, uh, what the visits are going to be like, and ultimately on longitudinal uh, care. Of course, we could not do any of this without our research staff, uh, including our research nurses, 
uh, and uh, uh, clinical managers, regulatory coordinators, clinical research coordinators, and genomic specialists, all of whom will help uh, in the research aspect of our clinical care, especially in the genotype-directed dir uh, care, which is such a big part uh, of our uh, current uh, clinical effort and portfolio. Uh, we've had some changes we, uh, uh, throughout the year. One of our physicians, Dr. Oxnard, uh, left uh, uh, Dana-Farber Cancer Institute to take on a leadership position at a diagnostic company. M many of you remember he was focused on uh, liquid biopsies in this company uh, and in this position. He's able to uh, do that on a greater role um, um, at, than he was able to do at Dana-Farber. We are continue to hire individuals into our center. We've uh, recently hired a new nurse practitioner. Uh, Elizabeth uh, Castronova, who will be starting with us in the uh, uh, early part of November, uh, where we have ongoing recruitments to, uh, uh, to build our clinical faculty and uh, we'll, are in the process of uh, hiring a clinical investigator uh, with a uh, focus on clinical and translational research, as well as an additional uh, nurse practitioner to uh, support our uh, growing uh, clinical volume. Some of you have heard that uh, we are uh, also in the process of expanding. Uh, uh, we as in the Dana-Farber, but uh, the thoracic program is part of this. Uh, uh, five miles uh, west of Dana-Farber, there is the uh, prior atrium mall, which has been converted into uh, 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 office building or office space. It also has a phenomenal gym at it. Um, and uh, uh, we will, we as in the Institute, will be expanding our clinical practices uh, to uh, Chestnut Hill. We are one of the uh, groups uh, of the Dana-Farber that will uh, expand their practice there. Uh, and we anticipate that approximately 30% of our clinical volume will move to Chestnut Hill. That'll provide opportunities for us to grow the clinical practice. It'll have an uh, in, infusion uh, uh, capability for, uh, to get infusional therapies there. It'll have imaging capabilities uh, there as well. And ultimately, we will transition a significant majority of our clinical trials to be available at, uh, at both, uh, uh, both, uh, both sites. And for people who live in the kind of west of uh, Boston, uh, this is a convenient location. It's right on Route 9. It's got uh, plenty of uh, parking available. Uh, some of our providers will practice both at the Longwood Medical Area and at Chestnut Hill. Some will uh, remain at Longwood Medical Area, so it just depends a little bit on the, on the, on the particular individual. And we anticipate uh, that this will open in January 2021. We're already sort of making plans and scheduling uh, uh, patients and uh, building up the, the footprint there. And so uh, more to come on that uh, uh, over, the, uh, over the next year. Just to highlight some of our uh, uh, work on uh, 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 genotyping and uh, uh, kind of what, we're, what, what we uh, uh, spend, our, spend our days and nights uh, thinking about, uh, sort of uh, targeted therapy or precision therapy is really our uh, hallmark of what we do for our patients, and that is to tailor the treatment to uh, the, the types of cancers that they have, defined by the genomic alterations, and we often show these or talk about these as a particular uh, pie, pie chart uh, uh, to kind of highlight these alterations. Uh, we were one of the first centers of the Dana-Farber to adapt to sort of routine genetic testing. Uh, it's of course important because as of today, we have seven genetic alterations in lung cancer where there are specific drugs approved. So it's very much a, an important component of what we do for clinical care, but for research as well. Uh, and there I mentioned some of the statistics in the bottom left we sequence about five to 600 patients uh, uh, from their tumors each year. Uh, an additional 300 individuals are getting sequencing from their plasma, from bl blood-based testing that we can sequence. And something that we're continuing to uh, now investigate further in another growth area for us is, is to study the germline, basically to ask, are there inherited uh, variants that potentially increase one's risk for for lung or other uh, uh, thoracic malignancies. And something that we as a field don't completely understand yet, but we have uh, institutional uh, resources and capability to now start to do this. And we think that uh, this will be an important area for us uh, uh, moving forward. Uh, if we think about uh, uh, the other areas uh, that, that are important for us, and of course, immunotherapy plays an in incredible uh, role into that. And, uh, we're, uh, uh, of course, continue to study patients' tumors for whether or not they have the pdl one expression because that's, a, that's an important component for us uh, in terms of figuring out the immunotherapy. As mentioned, uh, we do the liquid biopsies uh, for individuals. We study from the genetic analysis sort of the 
fingerprints of the tumor, such as the tumor mutational burden. You can sometimes get fingerprints of other exposures that individuals may have had uh, that help us uh, think about their cancer or guide the therapy of their cancer. Uh, and uh, we are, we as an institution are sort of taking the immune therapy testing from what you see on the top left, where it's sort of the, we test for this one single protein, the PDL1 protein, into a process of comprehensive immune profiling uh, that uh, will complement our comprehensive genetic profiling uh, and will really take us to the next level in terms of studying the, the, the nature of the immune system and how immune cells interact with tumor cells, something that no other place is really done on a systematic, uh, a systematic level or a comprehensive level. And we're very excited to be part of this. And of course, using that information, we'll ultimately be able to refine, I think, our therapies, especially our immune therapies, and to figure out better better approaches, better ideas about who is likely to benefit and, uh, and, and who may not benefit from uh, the particular types of approaches. So one of our sort of the major areas of uh, therapeutic areas for us was, I mentioned there are targeted therapies. Uh, we focus on strategies to overcome drug resistance and, novel, and deploy novel combination therapies. And that may be at the beginning of treatment or that may be at the time of resistance. Um, we monitor the tumor evolution through the blood-based analysis, as I alluded to before. Immunotherapy continues to be the other uh, area of, of, of importance, combination immunotherapy basis, thinking about, again, the biomarkers, so the sort of understanding of who may or may, may not benefit from immunotherapy. But we are also uh, 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 branching out into other uh, areas of novel therapies medicines like antibody drug conjugates, where we're using antibodies to specifically deliver drugs to, to cancer cells as opposed to normal cells. There's an increasing area of interest in developing vaccinations and can we, can we vaccinate in a way and the, 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 the patient and have the immune system, is that another way of sort of enhancing the immune system to go after the cancer? Neoadjuvant therapy, so we're increasingly giving treatments prior to surgery so that uh, uh, so far has uh, traditionally been chemotherapy that now includes immunotherapy and it will very soon include studies on giving precision therapies, targeted therapies for those individuals with those specific uh, genetic alterations uh, before the start of, uh, before surgery, again, to make surgery more successful and shrink cancers prior to uh, therapy. And I, I would say the last area uh, is, a, is a vastly growing area and that is to target KRAS mutant cancers if you remember in that pie, this is uh, collectively actually the biggest chunk of the pie. It is the genetic alteration that we've known about the longest, um, but it's one that uh, has been uh, recalcitrant to developing therapies. Um, for about half of that KRAS pie, there are new therapies, these KRAS G12C inhibitors, which are showing incredible promise in the clinic, and we have lots of activities in the other KRAS mutant spaces. And I think this is an area that will continue to grow over the next several years. Now, uh, one, of the, one of the things that uh, uh, I, I wanted to point out was that um, we are seeing that this approach, the personalized medicine precision therapy approach is making a difference. It's not just making a difference at the Dana-Farber or inside 128, it's making a difference in the uh, population of individuals at large. And this was a study that was published in the New, York, uh, New England Journal of Medicine uh, uh, this spring where the group uh, looked at the uh, uh, sort of population databases and looked at uh, sort of uh, uh, incidence and, and, and incidence-based mortality or death from lung cancer over time. And what they noticed was that uh, it was going down, uh, which, was, uh, uh, which is a good thing. Um, and what they also noticed was that if you look on the top left, what they also noticed was that uh, it was over the last several years, it was decreasing uh, uh, much faster than would have been anticipated based on just the incidence of lung cancer alone. And the authors attributed this inflection point to the fact that this was around the time when routine testing and use of EGFR inhibitors and ALK inhibitors uh, and routine molecular testing started and, and made the observation or conclusion that this uh, was uh, the, the, uh, the, the reason for uh, this observation. On the bottom left, you see that if you look at over time, again, on a population-based levels, survival of lung cancer, uh, patients with lung cancer continues to increase at a very nice pace throughout the year. And, and this analysis doesn't even include anything with immunotherapy. It includes, as I mentioned, two genetic alterations. We now have seven genetic alterations where we have targeted therapies. I think just tells us that 
we are making progress where that progress is having an impact in the world of lung cancer. And we hope that the ongoing progress will, uh, will make these numbers and curves look even better. Now, uh, it goes without saying that uh, it's been a tough time uh, uh, in the world uh, and, and, and uh, we have impact, been impacted uh, by COVID in multiple different ways as well. Uh, and this has uh, led to uh, uh, impact in both uh, or how we've been able to treat our patients, what has happened with clinical trials and what kinds of modifications we've been having to do to clinical trials. Uh, I think clinical care, uh, especially in the early parts of spring, uh, we noted some delays in definitive diagnostic procedures and surgeries when most hospitals had to be closed for elective surgeries and procedures. Um, patients are getting less lung cancer or cancer screening in general. Lung cancer is part of that screening, but in general. And I think uh, um, we also wanted to uh, modify some of our strategy, treatment strategies to reduce immune suppression, suppression and our visits to healthcare facilities. And this was particularly important uh, in the height of the COVID epidemic in the, in, in the spring and probably something that we will have to revisit as the case numbers uh, continue to go up. Um, we were man we did we're, we did manage to uh, make some strides in enrollment of, of patients into clinical trials. Uh, during the height of that, there was a fifty percent decrease in enrollment. We did part we did uh, make sure to continue to uh, prioritize therapies of oral agents, uh, and, and especially of those that would we think would provide a meaningful benefit to patients if other therapies had been exhausted. For example, again, the KRAS inhibitors. Uh, as for patients with uh, KRAS G12C mutations after chemotherapy and immune therapy, there are no approved targeted therapies. And so having a therapeutic approach was uh, uh, important. And some of, our, some of our sponsors put a hold on clinical trials during this time. We had to modify some of our strategies, so we couldn't necessarily do biopsies during this time. We couldn't do extensive pharmacokinetic blood analyses, and we didn't want patients to be in our clinics for extensive periods of time to reduce exposure or come in for serial EKGs. Uh, we have uh, did then and continue to use telemedicine to, to uh, see our patients virtually, to talk, ask them about toxicity events. Uh, we're using local laboratories and scans in some instances. Those of you who have participated or know family members that have participated in clinical trials, typically all the uh, work has to be done uh, locally in the site at Dana-Farber, but we're able to make exceptions and we are able to also mail out drugs to patients so they wouldn't have to come in. And, and through some of these modifications and prioritizations, I am happy to say that uh, this year, we in fact have enrolled the same number of patients on clinical trials as, as last year, and partly because we're able to uh, do some modifications, partly because our sponsors, the uh, sponsors of the clinical trials, were also uh, flexible uh, in some of these instances, uh, which uh, which uh, were uh, uh, were challenging at best. Were challenging. I think the other uh, uh, thing that affected our uh, society and world is the uh, racial injustices that have happened. Uh, and I think we see that on television every day. And I think it it, it's important for us to uh, also make sure that our care that we provide here is available uh, to everybody uh, uh, in the community. And I wanted to uh, highlight uh, uh, something that uh, we as an institution have worked on uh, 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 for uh, some time uh, on cancer, on the called the Cancer Care uh, Equity Program. Uh, this is, in fact, uh, uh, directed by Christopher Lathan. Chris is uh, one of our faculty members, uh, but has a passion for equitable care and making sure that care uh, uh, leaves the walls of, outside the walls of the Dana-Farber and is available for patients uh, in, in the community in Boston and throughout. And uh, uh, in, in this program that was established in 2012, uh, they started a community cancer care clinic, first within the what we call the Whittier Center Health Center, uh, which is in uh, uh, Roxbury, Massachusetts, not that far from uh, where Dana-Farber is uh, located. Uh, it's a clinic where they've been able to uh, serve 15,000 patients annually, uh, where 91% of the patients are at or below the national poverty level. The majority of patients are from minority groups and the majority of patients uh, uh, live in uh, public housing. And what, what Chris and, and his colleagues have been able to do is, is provide access to, to lung cancer screening, at, not only at the Whittier Clinic, but, uh, but uh, some of these other clinics as well. Uh, he's made sure that uh, patients who need follow-up, the patients are, there's facili he facilitates the referrals to lung cancer specialists to make sure that those patients are seen by our surgical colleagues, our pulmonologists uh, at the Brigham Women's Hospital. 
There are programs on tobacco cessation, uh, where, and uh, Chris has facilitated uh, over 70, uh, 70 workshops so far. Uh, and, and there's policy and model building as part of this effort to improve the quality of care delivery for low-income lung cancer patients. And so this is one example of how we, we are giving back to the community and want to make sure that we are able to, again, deliver the care that we give at the Dana-Farber to everybody in the community in an equitable manner. So uh, moving on to uh, some of our uh, 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 <clears throat> research and financial aspects. So this uh, represents the uh, philanthropy uh, that uh, the center has received over the last decade. Uh, and as you can see, uh, it has continued to uh, uh, increase in a steady, uh, a steady manner uh, throughout, uh, uh, throughout time. And I think what is nice that uh, uh, what we're able to do uh, with philanthropy is, uh, is, is to ultimately uh, use that to uh, apply for additional grants and, and, and awards from, the, uh, from either the government, uh, American Cancer Society, foundations, et cetera. And, and the philanthropic support is so critical for us for, for all of the uh, components of the program, but especially for many of the early research projects to be able to generate that uh, important uh, preclinical data, early clinical data, uh, something that gets people excited about the project, something that makes the investigator stand out amongst his or her peers uh, to be able to then say, yes, we should fund this. These, these guys can do this. They can do the work. They've already shown that they can do the work. And, uh, and, and, and I think that's, that's reflected here because if you look at the, the, the philanthropy, as the philanthropy grows, show, so do grants from the government uh, and uh, uh, places like American Cancer Society. Um, if you look at uh, uh, sort of uh, our support, where it comes from uh, uh, these uh, uh, in the program, uh, in the last uh, two years, uh, uh, it comes from uh, individuals, from corporations, foundations, events. So we're, we, uh, are, we, do, we do get uh, philanthropic support from multiple different uh, sources, uh, which uh, again helps us, uh, helps us uh, in, in all the different aspects of the program, as I mentioned. And, and just to give you a few examples of how we use uh, philanthropic funds, supporting young investigators, uh, uh, especially for our starting faculty members who want to make sure that uh, they, uh, uh, we, we, we hire people who we think will make a difference in the program, but we also want to keep people in the program. We want to provide them salary support so they have time away from clinic as well to uh, work on laboratory or translational clinical studies. Uh, uh, to, uh, to help uh, start their career. We provide research grants for innovative unfunded projects. Uh, we use uh, the philanthropic funds to, uh, uh, to, do, to sort of generate some infrastructure that we believe benefits uh, multiple people in the group. So for example, uh, studying uh, patient-derived tumors or biopsies that allow us to, uh, allow us to uh, uh, learn about why cancers become resistant to therapies, uncover the biology, and then help uh, uh, help uh, understand what therapies may work there. We also help cover the salary of research data specialists through uh, philanthropic support. And these are individuals who not only help in the, in the clinical care of patients as it relates to genotyping, but are instrumental in uh, uh, consenting patients to correlative science studies, studying developing databases and genetic analysis from the databases and, and, and coming and, and collecting and facilitating blood collection for blood-based studies. Uh, uh, that allow us to, again to do those sort of analyses over time of the evolution of cancers. And ultimately, uh, we use it uh, to well to support for clinical and translational research infrastructure, uh, for example, bioinformatics support for the Dana-Farber faculty. So studying big data, studying all of the genetic analyses, uh, you need specialists uh, to be able to, uh, uh, to do that, uh, to do those kinds of analyses. And, and, and again, we're able to hire individuals to do that, which benefits the, the whole uh, center as a, as, as a whole. So thank you uh, all uh, again uh, for uh, uh, all of uh, uh, all of your support and for being here today. And uh, again, I want this to be a uh, interactive uh, session. And again, please uh, uh, please uh, uh, feel free to submit uh, submit questions. So uh, with that, uh, we'll move on to the uh, uh, next. Um, or Bill, did you? Yes, Posse. First of all, thank you very much for the. Uh, Overview. I think it's really important for us to, to hear the, uh, the progress that's made from year to year. Uh, I have both an announcement and a, uh, and a question to pose. Um, first, in terms of the announcement, um, I would ask if everyone activated their 
uh, both their microphone and their camera. We do notice that a lot of people may have been muted. Um, and you, if you're not on camera, you don't have to be wor you don't have to worry about being muted. There is a technician um, that will take you offline so that your you know any background noise won't be heard. Um, so I just ask again that everybody activate uh, both their camera and their uh, and their microphone so that they can be brought into the conversation later. Um, and then next, um, Masi, I'd like to pose a question um, that was posed by David Gross Lowe. And the question is, um, the data from the New England Journal of Medicine on lung cancer incident declines, um, is it based on global populations or is it U.S. centric? Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's U.S. center. Uh, it's uh, um, uh, U.S. Pop U US populations. And maybe, Ken, uh, since you have worked with uh, population data, you can comment what SEER data means. Can you bring up Ken, Ken Keel? All right, thanks. So, yeah, I'm, I'm Ken Keel. I'm one of the medical oncologists and I do research in uh, the low center and in population sciences. So the uh, SEER um, uh, refers to a collection of data from state cancer registries within the United States. So every time a uh, uh, cancer of any kind, including lung cancer is diagnosed, they're reported um, to state cancer registries, which track those. And then the SEER program uh, gathers those together uh, to allow us to really look at national trends in um, incidence and uh, survival rates for different types of cancers. So, so that uh, analysis in the New England Journal was derived from an analysis of those data. Bill, did you want to move on? Yes, I'm just looking to see if there are uh, any additional questions. I guess one one additional question um, would relate to the impact of COVID on um, inpatient treatment in the clinic. I'm curious what the impact has been on inpatient versus virtual um, contact. Yeah, so um, we did about uh, at, at at the height of COVID again, sort of March, April. Uh, we uh, increased the capacity for telemedicine and did, I would say, uh, almost, in, in, again, varying by the uh, practitioner, uh, sometimes up to half or 75% of our uh, visits by telemedicine. Um, and interestingly enough, we hadn't done any of that really beforehand. Telemedicine wasn't a very big, uh, uh, a big part of our, our, our clinical practice. And, and, and so if there's Perhaps one positive thing to come out of COVID is certainly uh, introduction of uh, uh, introduction of telemedicine. I would say subsequently it has declined a little bit, um, and probably now it's about seven. At least for me, it's probably about seventy five percent in person, twenty five percent in telemedicine. And there are some some challenges to telemedicine. One is that um, if you do telemedicine across state lines. Uh, you technically have to be licensed in that state. So medical licenses are state-based licenses, and uh, um, uh, which is a challenge. And during sort of the COVID height, height, height of the COVID time, many of the local states lifted that restriction or had very sort of loose application processes, which many of us completed to get temporary licenses uh, in, uh, uh, in the adjacent states. But I do think it's here to stay. I think we're still figuring out in what capacity or how it'll best work, but uh, I, I do think it provides an, a, an alternative way to uh, to see patients and, and provide consultations on patients who are not able to travel here. Thank you, Posse. Um, I do think in the interest of time, it does make sense for us to transition to the conversation on EGFR. Uh, I will just mention that I, I do notice that I think Winston's microphone is still uh, muted. So as you invite him into the conversation. I see that he just unmuted it. So um, hi, Winston, and, and thanks, for, thanks for participating today. So th thanks, thank you, Bill, and, and, and Winston, thank you for joining us. Let me just give you a, a small background and then I'll, I'll, I'll uh, let Winston say a few words, is that uh, we uh, uh, were, for, during this past year, we're able to uh, uh, establish a center at, within our low center. So it's, it's a, within our center, the Chen Wang Center for EGFR Mute Lung Cancer. 
Um, and uh, as, as many of you know, the EGFR mutations and in, in studying EGFR mutant lung cancer has been, a, been a, a, a big focus of ours since we're involved in the initial discovery in 2004 and have studied this on the, uh, on the preclinical level and, and, and clinical level uh, since that time. Uh, and, and we're very grateful for the support from uh, Winston, uh, 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 Winston and, uh, and, and Phyllis for, uh, for their support of the center. And I maybe wanted to turn it over to Winston uh, first to mention a few, uh, few things and, uh, uh, and, and talk a little bit about uh, what inspired him to, uh, to do this. And then I'll sort of talk a little bit about the activities of the center. Winston. Sure, thank you. Uh, I'm Winston Chan, chairman of Parameters Foundation in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, it's our great honor to support a small portion of Dr. Yanni's uh, uh, lung cancer research. And as a family member of an EGFR lung cancer patient, uh, I'm extremely grateful for the scientists and the physician who have made tremendous progress in the targeted medicines. Um, we are particularly impressed by Dr. Yanni and his team for their great contribution in the basic research and the development of the new drugs. I personally have witnessed uh, the tremendous pro the benefit of the third generation targeted medicine osimertinib that has shrunk the patient's cancer mass by 80% in six months. And this has helped tremendously for the patient to turn from despair and fear to hope and living a normal life. So we cannot thank Dr. Yanni and his team for their outstanding contribution to make this possible. And I'm confident that they will continue to make breakthroughs to find a new treatment beyond the third generation targeted medicine for the EGFR mutant lung cancer patient in the future. So thank you very much, Dr. Yanni, and thank, thanks to uh, Denner Favre's the whole organization with a world-class expertise in this area. Thank, th th thank you, Winston, for those very kind words. And, 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 and likewise, we could not have made this possible without you and your family's generous support. And so uh, we're very grateful for that and, and very excited for this opportunity uh, to have this dedicated center on EGFR mutant lung cancer. It is the first of its kind. Uh, we're not aware of any that exist elsewhere. And so we're very excited to uh, sort of lead the way uh, in this as well. As mentioned, this was established last year with a, a generous philanthropic donation from the Chen Wang family. And really our mission is to improve the lives of patients with EGFR mutant lung cancer through innovative research and cutting edge clinical care. On the clinical care side, uh, we're want to think about strategies and are you know, thinking of uh, strategies to improve clinical care, provide opportunities for all patients to participate in therapeutic and correlative science studies, something that we do now, but this allows us to do it in a systematic manner, make sure we don't miss, uh, miss anybody and make sure that we continue to attract new patients to come to the center. On the research side, we wanna study the somatic changes, so the changes in the tumor, but, not, but also learn, as I alluded to earlier, learn and study what happens in individuals' blood. What can we learn about why individuals may have, may have uh, developed EGFR mutant lung cancer? Something that we don't really know much about, but something we can do as part of the center that we couldn't do before. We wanna continue developing new and novel uh, approaches uh, uh, to uh, studying uh, resistance and sensitivity uh, uh, to, uh, to various therapies. Uh, we want to develop models and continue to develop models from individuals as, as a way to study biology, but of course, as a way to optimize and test uh, new therapies and, and, and speed ultimately the development of new therapies from the preclinical space to the clinical space, something that we all want to happen in real time. Uh, and uh, sometimes we need a place like the center to catalyze these efforts. So uh, of course, COVID has uh, also affected our center, um, but uh, we're uh, able to uh, uh, move uh, 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 this along. Uh, we have a program manager, uh, I Candace Woods, who we hired for the center. Uh, she just started uh, uh, in uh, September of 2020. The second hire for the center will be a nurse practitioner who will be uh, 
one of the main clinical uh, uh, interfaces uh, for the center and, and, and both see patients and talk to patients from around the country. Uh, and uh, we have the, just the final uh, position postings being finalized. Again, some of these are delays uh, due, to the, uh, uh, due, to the, uh, due to the COVID pandemic. Uh, we want to build awareness of the center and its activities. And uh, one of the things that uh, Candace is working on uh, actively is the website and social media aspects of this. And then ultimately we want to uh, uh, work on sort of the activities of the center for which we still need the nurse practitioner, but uh, again, uh, so hope to come soon. Uh, we want to uh, make sure that we you know, discuss and review patients for clinical trials and translational research studies. Uh, there are certain toxic toxicity management needs that uh, uh, we can uh, and, and we know about because we uh, treat enough uh, uh, patients um, and uh, uh, are able to not only uh, learn about them, but are also able to provide guidance to uh, doctors in the community and outside the Dana-Farber who may not see that many EGFR mutant patients, but are still uh, uh, grappling uh, or, or dealing with toxicity that comes from an EGFR inhibitor. And we can provide guidance and, and, and those kinds of things uh, uh, to uh, doctors and also, of course, be a resource uh, to, um, uh, to individuals about clinical trials and, and, and clinical care. And uh, the final component, uh, which uh, I'm very excited about as well, is a dedicated effort on psychosocial support, something that we, of course, provide in our clinic, but something that I think uh, uh, allows us to uh, take this into a new direction that uh, we haven't done in a systematic manner. Uh, and uh, uh, for, uh, to discuss this in uh, a little bit more detail and kind of how this arose, uh, I wanted to uh, in invite uh, uh, Suzanne Lobecki. Suzanne, are you on? To discuss this. Hi. 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 Thanks. And, and can you, uh, um, if we can get Suzanne's slides, please. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yamani Chen, Ms. Wang, the Gilboard family, and all of you for your commitment to advancing lung cancer treatment and improving outcomes. Today, you're hearing a lot of groundbreaking discoveries and high-level science. With that backdrop, I'm honored to share with you how this translates to the patient experience. What does it mean to have lung cancer? Today, we're writing a new narrative, and you are a big part of this new story. In 2014, I joined the Lowe Center for Thoracic Oncology as one of their clinical social workers. And my role today is vastly different than it was at that time. I'm excited to share with you that our lung cancer patients are living boldly and leading productive lives. People with lung cancer are holding hope, a lot of hope, while at the same time, they're sitting with a high degree of uncertainty. The Gilboard Family Psychosocial Pilot Program is about holding hope and uncertainty at the same time, managing symptoms, finding meaning in the face of adversity. We're deeply appreciative to the Gilboard family for their vision for true integration of palliative and psychosocial care. We're in the process of launching this initiative within the Chang Wang EGFR Mutant Lung Cancer Center with the goal of reaching all of our lung cancer patients. Quality of life, what is it? Why is it important? And how can palliative care and psychosocial oncology help you? The Gilbert family raised these questions with us and we wanna share our answers with you. But first we want, I wanna introduce Bethany who is here to share with you the Bruce Gilbert story and why these questions are so important to all of us. Uh, thank you, Suzanne, and thank you to Dr. Yanni and to all of you at Dana-Farber. Um, facing cancer is, you know, a diag uh, just a crippling diagnosis, no matter how strong you are as an individual. And when Bruce was first told in the uh, surgeon's office at the Brigham that he had stage four cancer and that it was not surgical, it was medical, I quickly jumped into overdrive and said we needed to have an immediate appointment at the Dana-Farber that day, that afternoon, and I wanted a social worker to be present. Um, we had two sons, although out of college, 
I had, Bruce had a father, um, a sister. I had an aging mother I was taking care of in New York and I was also working out of state. And I knew that we were gonna require a lot of support, um, no matter how strong we were. We did find out that Bruce had an EGFR mutation. And I have to tell you, that was probably the happiest day of our lives because we knew that he didn't need chemo right away. He wasn't going to have radiation therapy. He had an FDA approved pill that he could take. And while we were happy about that, and gave us some hope, it did also give us uncertainty because we knew that there was not necessarily a cure. But the real story here is the need for the emotional and psychosocial support for the patient. And yes, I'm a healthcare executive. I know who to ask, what to ask, when to ask, and how to get it, but not everybody else does. And Bruce did benefit from me going into overdrive, trying to seek services. We knew they existed, but we had to ask for them. And the beauty of this program and what we, Bruce and I thought about was how do you develop something where patients don't have to ask, but it's automatic, it's given to them. And then they have a choice that they wanna opt out of having services. We, um, my husband was a very quiet guy in the sense that he internalized, he did not share his emotions, his feelings. He was very stoic. He wanted to beat this, but he also lived, as Suzanne indicated, with an uncertainty because we really didn't know what the outcome was. I knew that he was depressed early on, and I knew that a pill was not going to solve his problems. He really required talk therapy and people who could really engage with him. Um, we were very fortunate, albeit towards the end of his um, his treatment journey that Suzanne introduced us to Dr. Kate Lally and Dr. Michelle Jacobo, who were just absolutely exceptional um, lifelines for my husband. They were able to get him to open up, to talk, to sort of um, figure out what it was that he wanted to say, what he was feeling and how he was going to want to live his life towards the end, but more importantly, how is he gonna communicate and share with his loved ones, with his children, with his immediate family, and of course with me, his wife. And I knew that uh, their, their involvement with him was just absolutely meaningful and incredible. Um, and we wanted others to be able to share in that same experience. So before Bruce passed away and while he was still very cognizant, we talked about how we could do something to support others that were in a similar situation to us. And we decided that the best way of doing it was to do philanthropic support to help establish something around emotional support, psychosocial care for patients, for me in particular, who have EGFR because there is no cure right now. There's just prolongation, but eventually to all who have lung cancer. And after having met Suzanne, having met Dr. Lally, having met Dr. Jacobo, I realized that this was the team that we wanted to engage with. And then when we heard about uh, the EGFR center being established, which unfortunately happened after uh, Bruce passed away, we knew that this was the right place to put our efforts, our, our money and our vision. And so I want to thank um, Dana Farber, I want to thank the team, and I want to thank uh, the clinicians and the researchers who have been able to help my husband give him five years of, of life, almost five years of life, and to be able to help us take out some of the fear and the suffering, and to be able to really lean in as a family with lots of love and support. And we hope that we can do the same and share this with others and really help in the development of the research in this area around psychosocial support and emotional care uh, for oncology patients. So thank you, and uh, I look forward to seeing what becomes of this in the future. Thank you, Bethany, for sharing your story. Uh, it was an inspiration for our palliative and psychosocial intervention. With collaboration, Bruce and you were able to align his treatment with his quality of life goals and create many, many meaningful shared experiences over those five years. So support, connect, educate, empower. 
those are the four pillars of the psychosocial intervention. And I think Dr. Chen and Bethany both uh, indicate, as they both indicated, despair and hope and the existential angst that people feel when they're diagnosed with lung cancer is real. And we know that patients experience feelings of anxiety and sadness. And in fact, we'd be worried about you if you didn't. Uh, so the first pillar is the support and how do we um, how do we implement the support in a strategic, rigorous way that um, alleviates the patient from asking for the support as Bethany indicated. So the model that we're creating is an opt-out model. All patients uh, will be identified at time of diagnosis uh, as um, a person that someone from the palliative care and or psychosocial team will meet with to um, share some of the resources. We have very robust resources available at Dana-Farber uh, and help help them create, create their own program tailored to their specific needs. Uh, additionally, um, as of yesterday, uh, we are asking all of our thoracic patients to complete the distress screening um, and that will allow us to streamline uh, concerns, um, questions, worries that patients have, uh, and it will be universal across for all patients, again, alleviating, alleviating them of having to ask for support, whether it's practical or emotional, we can help, help them um, plug into the resources that are readily available for them. Um, so our goal is to provide a consistent access across the board for all of our patients um, so that they're not in the position of having to ask. Um, and we're going to start this in the EGFR clinic. So uh, once we identify the need, we'll connect them to their resources. Um, patients, we don't want patients to feel alone in their struggle. And uh, we're going to provide education. Um, People are eager to learn evidence-based coping skills, and we are um, we have the luxury of being disease-centered treaters. Um, and all I do is work in lung cancer, and if you have a worry, it's certainly probably something that I've heard before. Uh, we have um, Top Talks, which is a thoracic oncology program, psychoeducational, and support group that I, that's being read, led virtually in this time of COVID. Um, patients hear from the top providers, uh, thoracic providers, mind body. Um, they attend a class and then we have a didactic discussion afterwards. And really, the whole point is to empower our patients. You know, your experience is, is as unique as your fingerprint. And we want to hear from you what it is that you need in terms to feel well supported in your course of your treatment. So uh, thank you for um, this opportunity to launch the Gilboard Family um, Intervention within the EGFR Center. Um, our success uh, would not be possible without your support. The impact of your giving is tangible, concrete, and meaningful. Together, we're transforming lung cancer treatment options and leading edge research collaborative care. That is the impact of your giving. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, uh, Suzanne and, and, and uh, Bethany. Uh, for uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Suzanne and Bethany. Um, Bill, did you want to take questions now, or or move on to the next phase? Yes, I think we should uh, we should take questions. I'm um, I'm interested to know from uh, either you or Suzanne that you know th there seems to be. Um, this focus on um, EGFR, and I'm curious if it's this is something that's going to be extended to other uh, mutant cancers like KRAS or RET or. You know. Sure. Yeah, I, I, maybe I can address that. Yeah, I think uh, uh, by by focusing on EGFR mutant patients, we can uh, learn uh, uh, how well uh, uh, the strategies that we're planning on work, and where do we need to. Uh, uh, improve or refine our approaches, uh, both on the 
sort of therapeutic and, and translational side, but also on the psychosocial uh, side. And I think learnings from what we uh, find here are, of course, applicable to uh, uh, all of our patients in our clinic. I think we're we just want to we want to start this focused effort uh, uh, because we because I because it's been such a, a long-standing focus for us and allow kind of nucleate many of the many of the concepts initially uh, around the EJFR mutant patients. Thank you. I also would like to thank Suzanne and and Bethany as well for sharing their family story. Um, I do think in the interest of time, it probably makes sense to uh, move to our next agenda topic and introduce Ken. Okay, I wanted to uh, uh, introduce uh, Ken uh, Keel uh, from our program, uh, one of our uh, medical oncologists, uh, soon to be assistant professor of medicine. Uh, and uh, uh, he will discuss today about uh, use of uh, artificial intelligence and how we're using that uh, in uh, research and in clinical care. Um, and uh, Ken, please take it away. Great. Uh, thanks for having me to, uh, to discuss this topic of, of the role of uh, artificial intelligence or AI in, um, in catalyzing uh, lung cancer research and clinical care. So what is uh, artificial intelligence? Um, uh, artificial intelligence or AI is, um, uh, it has different, different, different definitions depending upon the audience, but it's a technology that's really been rapidly developing over the last decade, uh, not just in, in medicine, but across industries. Um, and uh, generally refers to uh, more or less teaching computers to do tasks that um, traditionally human beings have done, um, either so that uh, the tasks can be completed uh, faster or more at scale, you know, or more accurately than, um, than human beings have been able to do alone. Uh, but I think to have an impact in, uh, in medicine, we need to be specific about um, what the techniques can offer in the real world and in the near term. Um, and uh, so I think those, um, those definitions in terms of um, accelerating the work of human beings or improving the work of human beings are most salient for, uh, for medicine. Um, and if we go to the next slide. So uh, one thing that we're trying to do in the low Center um, together with the Division of Population Sciences at Dana-Farber is uh, really to use AI um, in part to accelerate the use of uh, tumor genomic data for research and cancer care delivery, uh, as well as to identify patients who may be eligible for certain key interventions. So um, in the past and, and on an ongoing basis, if we go to that next slide, uh, Dana-Farber has invested in a really extensive infrastructure for uh, delivering precision oncology, as we've heard from Dr. Yanni and, and across the board, by offering uh, next generation, very sophisticated tumor sequencing to patients so that we can understand the mutations uh, that might be present in their tumors and um, apply that information to select targeted therapies that might lead to tumor shrinkage for that specific patient. Um, still, I think one challenge that has persisted in really making the, the very most of, of these data is that uh, measurement of clinical outcomes, um, namely whether a patient's cancer grew or shrank after a certain treatment, um, which is information that is, is critical for answering important clinical research questions, um, has, has generally required that human beings manually review a medical record uh, to document whether and when uh, tumor growth or shrinkage occurred after a given treatment. And it seems intuitive that measuring those outcomes should be one of the easier aspects of precision cancer medicine, but um, outcome ascertainment so far has been um, a, a real bottleneck in carrying forward some of our research questions. And on the next slide, uh, one thing I've illustrated here is um, how we've tried to apply what are called deep learning techniques to essentially train computer models to read through the medical record for us and determine what a patient's response to a particular therapy was. Uh, the phrase deep learning basically just means using these ma uh, multiple steps of, of what are really mathematical transformations to change some raw data input into a clinical prediction. So one thing I've spent some time on is, is turning clinical text into a prediction, for example, by feeding 
imaging reports generated by radiologists as they describe the changes in a patient's tumor into an algorithm that will tell us at scale, was that radiologist describing improving or, or worsening cancer? Um, and uh, one of the reasons this sort of deep learning approach has become prominent across industries, including in medicine, is that this sort of strategy can be applied to uh, extract information out of lots of different types of data, whether it's clinical text or vital signs, laboratories, even the raw um, uh, imaging scans that uh, patients get as their tumors are assessed. Um, so we've demonstrated that this approach does seem to be um, feasible and, and may give us the ability to identify those patients who've had perhaps unusually good or, or um, suboptimal uh, responses to a particular uh, treatment at scale. So we've now used, used this approach to um, annotate the records of all of the thousands of patients with lung cancer at Dana-Farber who've had their cancers genomically profiled uh, through the um, division and institutional uh, study. And on the next slide, um, another very practical use case for this kind of AI could be to identify patients who may be eligible for clinical trials um, at the specific time when they really need a clinical trial. Um, so as, as folks may know, Dana-Farber has previously built a tool that can match patients to clinical trials based on the genomic data that are contained within their uh, tumors. And, and this is a screenshot from, uh, from this clinical trial matching tool that can demonstrate uh, the, the information that a clinician might get when they uh, click a button um, in, in their patient's record uh, to ask, okay, what clinical trials might, be, might my patient be eligible for? Uh, but one of the challenges is that patients are only eligible for clinical trials or only need clinical trials at specific points in time when their cancer might be uh, worsening, um, and, and yet they're still able to receive additional treatment. So by uh, applying the models we've trained to find worsening cancer really on a division and institutional basis, um, it'll become possible to not just find the patients who have genomic features in their tumors that might match them to a clinical trial, but find those patients who are ready for a clinical trial at a specific time. Um, and on the next slide, I've just tried to sort of illustrate that uh, workflow in that in the upper left, so far, um, uh, this tool has been able to match the genomic profile of a patient's tumor together with the uh, eligibility criteria of a specific clinical trial in order to find patients who may be eligible. But what we're trying to really augment is that, um, that sense of whether a patient's eligible for a particular clinical trial um, at a given time using the data available in their electronic medical record. And then on the next slide, um, another potential use case uh, for AI and lung cancer uh, care in particular could be identify pa identifying patients for, for lung cancer screening. So these are the results from um, the well-known now uh, National Lung Screening Trial which randomized patients to uh, screening for lung cancer with chest x-rays or with uh, CT scans and demonstrated that CT scan screening could identify more lung cancers but reduce death from lung cancer um, for appropriate uh, patients. Um, but on the next slide, uh, what I've done there is um, summarize some state-by-state -state data around the um, proportion of eligible patients, um, namely folks who were in the right age group who had a smoking history that made them eligible for lung cancer screening, who actually um, have, have had that screening done. In, in the bottom row, what you can see is, for example, in, in Florida, something like 19% of eligible patients had uh, lung cancer screening done. Uh, and similar low rates were seen across the board in other states, 7% in Nevada, 11% in Georgia. So this has remained a real um, barrier to optimizing the impact of, of lung cancer screening. And again, one of the things that AI techniques can do is parse through all of the information in a patient's health record at scale to identify those patients who have the characteristics that make them eligible for lung cancer screening and potentially flag their primary care providers or healthcare systems 
to try to optimize the, the uptake of this potentially life-saving screening intervention. And on the next slide, the other potential use case for AI in lung cancer diagnosis, screening, and, and care is, in fact, in um, training models that are able to actually more or less look at the uh, clinical images that are generated when, when a patient has a, a CT scan or other uh, type of imaging study done um, and apply something called computer vision to potentially make the work of a radiologist in finding a lung cancer that might be otherwise unrecognized, um, you know, more straightforward. Uh, so for example, one of the things these models can do, which is um, illustrated here in the, um, in the middle uh, of, of this slide is that um, given a record of, of imaging studies for a particular patient, um, the models can learn to look for changes and, and potentially highlight them for, for radiologists to um, help make otherwise occult cancers more obvious. And um, this kind of work has been applied across um, cancer types as well in other disease settings like in mammography and, and in cervical cancer screening. And I think one of the potentially important use cases here is also to um, uh, make some of these techniques more accessible in, in resource poor settings. So um, I think AI in summary does have the um, uh, potential to, um, uh, again, accelerate the um, uh, use of tumor genomic data for research and care delivery. I think we've gone back in the um, slide deck here. So I'll just turn back to the key points. Yeah. So, um, and, and I think that uh, strategy can um, really facilitate the goals of precision medicine and learning from the experience of every patient. Um, I do think that useful AI uh, must both facilitate discovery and um, improve patient outcomes in, in a demonstrable way. And uh, finally, I think that uh, AI does require uh, this sort of same rigorous clinical testing that we might apply to any other medical innovation or, or treatment. Uh, and I think, I think that's all I have. Fossey, I believe there's a question um, from Bethany uh, to be directed to Ken, if we could, if we could make her uh, live. Hi, um, Dr. Kell. Um, when you were talking about the clinical trials and the availability and the research that you're doing, is this something that's available um, in Epic, and is it just limited to those oncologists who are on Epic, or only those that are currently affiliated with Dana Farber um, to have access? Because that sounds like just a fabulous. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Piece of uh, work. <laughs> at, at, at the moment, the hope is to um, uh, make uh, this sort of technology available uh, within the context of the um, the Dana Farber match minor um, effort. So for, for Dana Farber oncologists, though that would include Dana Farber satellite sites around mm -hmm. the, um, the area. Um, uh, in part, the institution already has that match minor tool there, which we can use to try to um, uh, pilot this process, really. I think if it uh, is successful, then I think it'll be um, uh, an example of something that, you know, could hopefully be deployed more broadly. Thank you. Thanks, Bethany. And let me remind others, if you do have a question for Ken, if you click on the raise your hand button, uh, we'll make your camera live and you can pose the question uh, directly. But while we're doing that, um, Ken, I, I'm, I'm curious what the risks to implementing AI in practice might be. In other words, what if the, the information or data were biased in some way? Um, how would you deal with that? Yeah, so that is a, um, a critically important question and one that cuts across applications of AI in different uh, fields. It's obviously particularly important in medicine to get a model right to ensure that it's not biased against different uh, subpopulations. Um, I think, um, you know, there's one, there's no one perfect answer to that problem, but um, involving 
clinicians uh, and ideally patient stakeholders in the process of designing these interventions um, and and uh, applying techniques that um, that do exist to um, make AI models what are called interpretable so that individuals can understand why the models made the predictions that they did um, are especially important when it comes to uh, applying AI in, in medicine and in uh, cancer care. Thank you, Ken. Um, and as I'm reviewing uh, questions, I do notice there was a question from David Gross Lowe uh, that I may have overlooked earlier, and I'm not sure whether it's directed to uh, Posse or Ken, but uh, if we could make uh, David's camera live, that would be great. Uh, it looks, if, if David, if you would like to uh, pose your question, I think you need to make your camera and, uh, and audio live. So we'll just give you a second to do that if you'd like to. Um, Great. Sorry. That's okay. Hi, David. How's it going? Um, yeah, thank you. No, it, this was a prior topic, so I'm sorry to take us out of the uh, potentially the flow here, but uh, Patsy, it was, it was a question for you around um, a little bit more on the impact of, of COVID. It, it, there's a lot of focus, attention, resources, and money going into um, obviously vaccine research as a result of COVID. And I was kind of curious, um, maybe two questions. One, do you see any impact there in terms of diversion of resources to cancer research related to your efforts the second one, the second part of it is just, is there any positive spillover benefit from um, the work that's being done there on immunotherapy or other pathways, given there's a lot of focus on pulmonary and lung related research as it relates to maybe not the vaccines, but at least on the therapeutic side of that equation. I just don't know if there's any, you know, thing that you'd look for in terms of uh, potential positive findings and scientific kind of spillover effect. Sure. So maybe I'll take the the, the, the first one. Um, I think this time in general has been uh, tough for, um, uh, for foundations that we normally uh, rely on or, or apply for support. American Cancer Society, uh, lung cancer foundations in general, many of them are not uh, uh, going to be offering the same grants this year. You know, some of them have to have laid off staff. I think just economy and the support that those foundations rely on has uh, has been impacted by COVID. And I think we are go have are feeling it now and are going to feel it next year uh, because uh, this is the time that normally we would apply for many of these uh, uh, many of these grants. So I do think that there are effects of, of that in general. Um, in terms of the second question, um, I'm not sure. Um, you know, most of the uh, sort of strategies are either antiviral strategies or trying to limit the sort of inflammatory response that uh, can happen from COVID with steroids and other things. Um, you know, I, I don't know that uh, that will necessarily translate into anything uh, in our, our field, maybe perhaps managing toxicities in the lungs that, that happen from immune therapies, chemotherapies, <coughs> Therapy. So maybe some somewhere in that area, uh, but I, I think a little bit a little bit too early uh, uh, still to uh, still to know. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, Posse, I don't see any additional question. Do you have uh, any additional comments before I turn it over to Alice? Well, yeah, certainly. Uh, if anyone has questions, uh, uh, please uh, uh, feel free to. Uh, uh, Feel free to ask them. Um, you know, I, I it's it's a, a, a you know first of all thanking thank you everyone for being here today and uh, uh, as you see we're trying to move forward in, uh, in in multiple areas and I think Ken highlighted uh, one of the one of the features and we we typically try to highlight uh, things every year of different aspects of our program and how we're using uh, technology in this case to uh, uh, improve diagnostics and improve matching therapy so I think a very nice example and. Thank you, Ken, uh, uh, very much uh, uh, for that presentation. Um, 
Alice, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Patsy. Again, thank you all to all our guests for your support of the Lowe Center. We welcome all your thoughts, as we've mentioned, and any additional questions that you may have. Use the function on your screen to raise your hand if you would like to ask that way. Um, Bill and I will be sharing your comments at an executive session on November 2nd with President Laurie Grimshaw. We hope you enjoyed this session. Um, thank you, Dr. Yanni, Winston and Phyllis, Suzanne, Bethany Gilboard, and Dr. Keel for sharing both your time and your most inspiring work. Before we move on, are there any other questions for our presenters now? Please be aware that all the content of today's uh, event will be available on the landing page following the event. Certainly our presenters are most appreciative of your philanthropic support. And you are aware of the great successes of the Thoracic Oncology team. Dana Faber is able to provide help as well as healing because of you. So we strongly encourage you to add to or increase your support. Know that Patty Brent will certainly help you in this regard. Uh, following this session, we will close with some remarks from Dr. Glimpshire. Thank you again. Good. Hello again. I hope you all enjoyed a productive breakout session and the time to connect with one another. Please accept my sincere gratitude for your participation. And again, I would like to thank Dana Farber's trustee and faculty chairs whose names you'll see on your screen for leading today's discussions. They have diligently taken note of your questions and ideas, and I'm looking forward to meeting with them next week for an executive session to ensure that I am apprised of your questions and your ideas and your feedback. While, of course, uh, we would have preferred to meet in person, as we have for nearly two decades for this symposium, one distinct opportunity of this year's format is the ability to expand access to this program to an even wider community. In fact, at the executive session last year, one of the main recommendations from our trustee and faculty co-chairs, based on your feedback, was to shape, share this symposium more widely through video and technology to enable even greater participation for those who might not be able to get to Boston. To that end, recordings from today will be available to you and to those who couldn't join us live as well the community and resources sections at the top of this event platform will continue to be available in the months ahead. And those are additional ways to stay engaged with each other and to spread the word to others about Dana-Farber's advances in research and care. At Dana-Farber, together, our community is a force to be reckoned with and we can't ignore cancer. Our together is comprised of you, our foremost advocates, and our physicians, nurses, clinical support staff, whose compassion is a beacon of hope, and our scientists who are among the most brilliant minds in the world, and children and adults with cancer who motivate all of us to accelerate prevention, therapies, and cures. Our together is embodied by the Jimmy Fund and our mantra, we're all Jimmy, we're all Jimmy where Jimmy is every patient, doctor, nurse, staff member, donor, and event participant. Everyone who joins to support groundbreaking cancer research and care at Dana-Farber, as you will witness on the screen now to close today's program. I look forward to continuing this conversation. Thank you so much for joining us, and I wish you strength, wellness, and peace to you and your families. Jimmy is a boy, saved from leukemia by Dr. Sidney Farber. Jimmy is a girl, a nephew, a husband, a wife. Jimmy is every patient ever at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Their families, friends, neighbors, every doctor, nurse, and researcher at Dana-Farber, every event walker, runner, rider, and golfer. 
Support the Jimmy Fund and give more and more of us a second chance at life. Because we're all Jimmy.